Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, my name is Aurora Dizel with Darby Creek Valley Association. I appreciate you being here tonight. Um, we have the we have John Higas and Jan, who is not on camera, but she is there. Um, they are local historians. They are also emeritus board members of the Darby Creek Valley Association, um, and they're here to tell us about the history of our area, which is really interesting. They've put together a really nice presentation. Um, I thought maybe John, you could just tell us a little bit about yourself before we get into the presentation. Sure. Actually, it's aspects of the history because okay. history is like history is like the six blind men and the elephant, which is my very favorite story. Six blind men always heard about something called elephant. So they wanted to know what the elephant was like. So they went to find one. And they did. The first one came up the side and said, oh, the elephant's like a wall. The second grabbed the leg and said, no, 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 the elephant's like a tree trunk. The third grabbed the tail and said, no, 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 the elephant's like a rope. The fourth touched the tusk, ouch, no, it's like a spear. The fifth one grabbed the trunk, oh, no, no, the elephant's like a snake. Sixth one grabbed the ear, oh, no, the elephant's like a flag. So they went away arguing what the elephant was like. All of them were right. None of them were wrong but no one had the whole elephant. And history is a lot like that. It kind of depends on where you're standing. You know, um, the history told by Native Americans is gonna be very, very different than the history told uh, by one of the settlers. You know, it's, and uh, we see the world through the lens of our experience. Anyway, uh, Jan and I moved to Southwest Philadelphia in 1983. Mm -hmm. And we became involved with something called the Bluebell Tavern, which is a little stone building where Island Road becomes Cobbs Creek Parkway and Woodland Avenue becomes Main Street in Darby. It was a building that was derelict. Um, and it's on the Cobbs Creek. On the Cobbs Creek. Um, we went to the park and say, what can you tell us about this building? Well, there was a battle there during the Revolutionary War. Someone looked at one time for a restaurant, but the side was too small. So I went home, grabbed Jan and our friend Pam and looked at it and called them back, said, well, called up the park. What can we do about it? Well, make a proposal. So we did. We didn't know anything about running a restaurant. So we basically incorporated it as a nonprofit. Um, Jan saw a notice in the local paper about a cleanup uh, along the Darby Creek and in called 1987. 1987, called and spoke to John Firth, I think it was. Yeah. And he said, well, you moved your timetable up a little bit, but sure. So we had a cleanup at the Bluebell. Um, also at the Bluebell, we started doing programs about the Bluebell and uh, singing programs, which sort of started us doing 18th and 19th century music and living history. Uh, let's see, Jan coordinated the cleanup for about 10 years. Yeah, about 13 years. 13 years. Uh, and we're gonna start off this segment with uh, part of the Darby Creek song that we wrote. Mm -hmm. So, so tell uh, them a little bit, anything else you want to tell them about you? Um, not that I can. Not that you can think of. I mean, our, our <laughs> website is past times present. We also have a website, darbyhistory.com. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure. Other, I mean, it would be hard to shut me up once I, I start talking. Yeah. That's okay. So okay. thing you recorded this. <laughs> okay. Well, yes. Yeah, yeah I'm glad. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I guess we are ready to go. I will share my screen. Yeah. And I just, while you're doing that, I just want to remind everybody, um, you may want to turn your volume up when we kind of gave this a test drive yesterday. It helps to have your, your computer volume up. Um, make sure that you're on mute so that everybody can hear. And this is done in two segments, two parts. So after the first part, which as you can see is about 17 minutes, um, we'll have some time for questions if you have any questions and then we'll go into part two. Okay, um, can you mute, mute everybody? I lost sure. my microphone somewhere. Yeah, okay, I can bye. do that. Okay, so here, here we go. Up. 
So I am not hearing any of the sound. Um, John, are you hearing it on your end? I am hearing, yeah. yes. Okay, well, Hang that's... On. Okay, turn okay it on. so what... Um, can you turn it up? Uh, you I'm, I'm up, have it of the volume up as high as it can go. Yeah, when we did it last night, I heard it just fine. So I'm not yeah. sure what's different. I'm not sure either. Do you have your um, mic on? Uh, no, the mic is not no, in the mute. the mute. No, the mute is not on. Um, there is a, let me see what's going on. Wait. Oh, no, it should. I mean, you can hear me talking. I can. Mm -hmm. So you should hear it. Shall, shall we go to plan B? Do you have the, the link and you could play it? Is there a Bluetooth involved? We can try that. We can try it from my computer from my computer um, yeah, and see if it makes I, a difference. Uh, Cause I'm, I am not muted and you're hearing my voice. So you should be able to hear it, but you're not hearing it at all. I didn't hear anything. Did anyone else hear anything? No, I didn't. No, okay. Oh dear. I didn't Let's either. See. Okay. Let's see if okay. I can bring it up all right. and see if right. that makes any difference. A second. There it goes. Was the, you heard it. From I heard me. it there. Heard okay, it. so I'm going to share my screen. Um, John, can you stop? I sharing? stopped my sharing. Yep. Okay. Um, there we go. Okay, let's try this again. Each valley a creek is flowing under siege by the forces of man. Are we good? So mm -hmm. take care of the covering green valley. I can hear I well. However, many people believe they know Derby, the place of floods, the home of the blue airplane, the home of America's oldest public library in continuous use birthplace of W.C. Fields, and the place that gave its name to Darby Creek. It's all of that, and much, much more. In the beginning was the watershed, which is an area of land that drains to a common point. We we're all part of the Delaware River watershed, and the creek that writer Christopher Morley called, once called a laughing little river that preaches sermons unawares. Beginning in the spring, somewhere near Dalesford and Chester County, the creek flows downhill like all of the watersheds, flowing to a common point. As it flows, it is joined by other waters, and finally flows into the Tenecon Marsh and into the Delaware River, which the Lenape called the Lenape Widdock, or Lenape River. When explorer Henry Hudson, working with the Dutch East India Company, visited the river in 1609, he called the river the South River by which it was known until after the English conquest of New Netherland. In the same way, he called the Hudson River the North River. The first inhabitants of the area were Algonquin speakers who called themselves the people, the Lenape, or sometimes the people people, or original people, Lenny Lenape, a loose association of related peoples who spoke similar languages and shared familial bonds in an area known as the Nepehoki, their territory was along the Delaware River watershed from New York through New Jersey and Southern Delaware. Organized in small matrilineal groups with leaders chosen for their ability and wisdom, they hunted, fished, planted, traded, and interacted with other nations, including the Iroquois speaking Susquehannock to the west and the Iroquois Federation to the north. They established various villages along the rivers and tributaries. Excavations in West Philadelphia in 2001 along today's Civic Center Boulevard reveal evidence of settlements along the west bank of the Schuylkill River and provide evidence of fairly large and stable indigenous community occupying the area during the late archaic and early woodland periods about 6,000 years ago. The people would hunt for meat and for animal skins to be made into clothing and items for use. But Dr. Marshall Becker in a talk at the Bluebell once told us, once they had enough for their needs, the rest of the skins were discarded. 
When the Europeans arrived, they wanted furs. And the people realized these strangers were willing to give them neat stuff, for it was essentially their trash. Holy recycling, Batman! European powers especially wanted beaver pelts in order to use the fur to make felt for the beaver hats. And the beaver war ravaged the St. Lawrence Valley and lower Great Lakes throughout the 17th century. In our area, the beaver wars played out in the continuing rivalry between the Swedish and the Dutch. The Dutch established Fort Nassau, 1623, near the mouth of Big Timber Creek in present-day Gloucester County, New Jersey, and then built Fort Beaver's Reed, the Beaver Road, at the terminus of the Great Minquas Path on the east bank of the Schuylkill at Point Breeze. Swedish Governor Prince built Princehof in Tinicum Island, today's Essington, from where he could control trade on both the Delaware and Schuylkill rivers. Prince was a large man of some 400 pounds. The Indians called him Big Belly. Not exactly sure why. But he came with specific instructions from the Swedish crown to treat the wild nations with humanity and respect and give them better prices on trade goods they're getting from the Hollanders or the English so they would be war one to our people. The wild nations, bordering upon all other sides, the governor shall know how to treat all humanity and respect and see to it that no violence or wrong be done to them by the people of her royal majesty and of her subjects aforesaid but he shall rather at every opportunity exert himself so that the same wild people may gradually be instructed in the true christian religion and worship and in other ways brought to civility and good public manner as though led by the hand Especially shall he bring them into the state of mind that they believe that he, the governor, or his subordinate people, are not come into those parts to do them any wrong or injury, but much more for the purpose of bringing them to hand what they need for their domestic common life, and sell and exchange such things for other things which are found among them, and which they themselves have no use for. Therefore, the governor shall also see there to be let the people of her royal majesty or of the company who are engaged for the trade in those parts allow the wild people to obtain the necessary things they need for somewhat more moderate price than they are getting them from the hollanders from fort nassau or the adjacent english all to the purpose that said wild people may be withdrawn from them and so much more turn to our own people the Minquas Trail was a fur trading route from the Susquehannock region to the Dutch and Swedish fur trading posts along the Schuylkill and Delaware rivers, as often viewed as Pennsylvania's first highway. It is believed to have traveled through Moylan Rose Valley near the Hedgerow Theater and across the Darby Creek at the site of the 12th Street Dam, and then across Darby, where it would cross Cobbs Creek using the rocks at the site of Prince's 1645 Mill which is also the site of the Bluebell Inn. The first water-powered mill in what later became Pennsylvania was built circa 1645 by Governor Johannes Prince to replace the windmill, which was good for nothing. In the creek, the locals called Caracom, Goose Water, and what the Swedes called Mondel, or Place of the Mill. It was a Norse or tub splash mill with the mill wheel horizontal to the water and the shaft attached directly to the millstone. It was one of the easiest mills to build and operate and was said to have run both early and late and can be seen as the birthplace of Pennsylvania industry. For those who might be interested, there is a model of the mill in the Hagley Museum in Delaware. At times, what we now know as Cobbs Creek was called Mill Creek. It forms the boundary between Philadelphia and Delaware counties and flows into Darby Creek near the site of Ann's Rock and Colwyn. Close by was the site of Fort Nyavasa, said to be a hickory blockhouse inhabited by free men. It is possible, but by no means certain, that this may have been the location of the Court of Upland when it moved to King Sessing in the Schuylkill in 1680 for the greater ease of the people. Dr. Amandus Johnson found square holes carved into the rocks just below the present Cobbs Creek Dam near the Bluebell, and determined that was the location of Swede's Mill. 
the most visible reminder of the new Sweden colony, which began in 1638 at Fort Christina in Wilmington, Delaware, under Peter Minuit, former governor of the Dutch New Amsterdam colony, is a Swedish cabin in Clifton Heights, which is given a date of 1650. Henry Paxson, in his 1926 book, Where Pennsylvania History Began, said the dream of Swedish King Gustavus Adolphus was to create a haven in the New World free from the religious strife that ravaged Europe. Gustavus Adolphus died in 1632, and since his daughter Christina was only six, Axel Oxesterner continued as Lord High Chancellor during Christina's regency and was in charge when the new Sweden colony was created. He was a diplomat beyond compare and is beyond the scope of our talk today, but Queen Christina, after whom Queen Village in Philadelphia was named, was a very interesting person. In 1644, two years after the arrival of Prince, upon reaching her majority, Christina abdicated the throne, converted to Catholicism, and moved to Rome, where she was a patron of the arts. Pope Alexander VII, who was Pope at the time of her conversion, described Christina as a queen without a realm, a Christian without faith, and a woman without shame. Notwithstanding, she played a leading role in the theatrical and musical community and protected many broke artists, composers, and musicians. She deserves another look, but we are concerned with the Darby Creek Valley. Prince arrived in 1642 and had a good run of some 11 years, went through a mutiny, hung the ringleader of the mutiny, and left in 1653. He left his son-in-law and daughter Armago in charge, but that is a whole nother story. Johannes Rising arrived in 1654, and his first act was to capture the Dutch fort of Fort Casimir, which had been created by Director General of New Netherland, Peter Stuyvesant. It was perhaps a tactical blunder. Peg Lake Stuyvesant subsequently led an expedition to New Sweden and ended direct Swedish political influence. In a twist of the saga, as empires rise and fall, Sir Richard Carr, captured New Amsterdam from Stuyvesant for the English in 1664. And although the Dutch briefly regained sovereignty in the English-Dutch War of 1673, it had all changed. From a play called Upland, the people said, who's in charge, who's in charge? First it was the Dutch, then it was the English, then once more it was the Dutch. Well, it gets so confusing, it's all a bit too much. Stuyvesant was the cheese in charge of a place now called New York. Nichols then did away with him, popped him like a cork. Lovelace then, he took the helm until the Dutch came back. Colby then was the man in charge until he got the sack. The Dutch gave back the colony and then Andros was in charge. His territories included us and he was living large. He came down to see us and we made a petition to have some courts of justice and to understand our position. One of the lesser known but still fascinating aspects of the Darby Creek watershed is the Court of Upland. In 1673, inhabitants of the South River went to New Amsterdam to petition for various things, including free trade with Christians and Indians, rights in the government, and freedom of conscience. It is perhaps coincidental that George Fox, the founder of the Religious Society of Friends, otherwise known as Quakers, passed through the area visiting Quakers from Barbados to New England in 1673. In any event, the deputies entering and delivering their credentials, further declaring their submission to the sovereignty of their high mightinesses, the Lord State General of the United Netherlands and His Serene Highness, the Prince of Orange, with a request that they be granted and allowed some privileges, handed into that effect some articles. Freedom of conscience is an interesting concept. And when I first heard about it, I was fascinated. 1673, freedom of conscience. In any event, the English regained sovereignty and the court began to sit in 1676. And it was a fascinating look at a people's court created to make a forum to resolve disputes rather than a tribunal to impose morality. The inhabitants of the said river were ordered to nominate by a plurality of votes for each court, eight persons as magistrates. There was one court set at Bontishook, another one set at New Amstel, which later became Newcastle, and one at Upland, which in 1680, for the greater ease of the people, moved to King Sessing in the Schuylkill. In addition to contract disputes and land purchases, 
Notable cases include one in which an indentured servant by the name of Richard Duckett was indicted for keeping company with and getting with child a certain mulatto woman named Schwart Anna. Richard Duckett was an indentured servant, and so his time was not his own. He said his intention was to marry the said Anna, but Anna is not listed as England's property, so was very likely a free woman of color living in the Delaware Valley. Another case involved a distraught father who petitioned the court for help with a son who had gone quite mad. And there was also a series of disputes between Mounds Stackett and almost everybody else. As an example, in October 1680, an action for assault and battery held at King Cesset, Wharton Morton, who came with Johannes Rising in 1654, testified that a stand up bound stake he was on horseback and called for his sword, his gun, powder, and shot, and then rode before Hans Julian's door and called him, saying, You dog, you rogue, come out, I will shoot you a bullet through your head. All this passed in the night, and the opponent says to have heard but not seen it. I had an opportunity to meet with a descendant of said Mount Steckett, who told me the name was like saying Mounds the Stick, and that alcohol may have been involved. The verdict was, the court, having heard the debates of both parties, do find it necessary for the preventing of future mischief to order, and do hereby order, that both plaintiff and defendant are hereby bound over to their good behavior, strictly to keep his majesty's peace to each other and all other his majesty's subjects for the space of one year and six weeks next ensuing, upon the penalty of four hundred pounds of lawful money of England to be paid by him that shall first break the peace. To his majesty's use, and to further condemn him, the said Mount Stakett, to pay a fine of 200 guilders to be applied for the frame of the court's needs and expenses, and each to pay half charges for the action. In addition, there was mention in the court of Upland about relationships with the native inhabitants. Lastly, Mr. Israel Helm hath been often employed by Captain Catwell as interpreter with the Indians, who now make application to this court for some recompense for a said trouble and time. Also, in 1676, at a meeting held by the commander and justices at Upland upon the news of the Simico Indians coming down to fetch the Susquehanna that were amongst these river Indians, March the 18th, 1676, it was concluded upon the notions of Renouan the Indian Satchmore for the most quiet of the river that Captain Collier and Justice Israel Helm go up to Shackamaxon, where at present a great number of Simico and other Indians are and that they endeavored to persuade the Simicos, the Susquehannock, and these river Indians, and each send a Satchmore or deputy to his honor the governor at New York, and that Justice Israel Helm go with them to hear and receive his honor's resolutions and answers to their demands. The last entry for the Court of Upland was a letter sent from New York in June 1681, announcing that Charles II had granted William Penn a charter for all the tract of land in America, now called by the name of Pennsylvania. And thus began a new chapter with the arrival of the Quaker William Penn. And the first time the name Darby was associated with Pennsylvania. It's perhaps interesting to note that Chackamaxon was also the site of the conference with the Indians and the famous treaty, which according to Voltaire, never sworn to and never broken.
Okay, thank you. Um, that was great. Um, let's see, I just wanted to pause. We have a part, part two, but um, before we get to part two, I wanted to see if there were any questions. Um, and also, John, if you have any comments that you wanna add before as well. You can just go ahead and unmute. We have, a, I think, a small enough group that if you wanna just unmute and, and speak up, that's fine. John, I wanted to ask, uh, for one thing, that that was wonderful. Um, you and Jan have made a really wonderful piece of art. And part of your narrative involved these really great long sentences that were rhyming. And I was just curious if that was your own <laughs> pen or could you talk a little bit about the narrative and how that came together? Um, was your poetry? Some some yeah. was poetry. Uh, the that bit of, yeah. the, the bit about the who's in charge. First it was the cheese. I mm -hmm. um, I encountered the court of Upland, and again the idea of a court to provide a forum for disputes rather than to. I'm from New England, uh, Western Massachusetts, nevertheless close enough to Salem. You know the the clerics um, were the judges, and so any infraction against the state was an infraction against God. And this was free from, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, and I wrote a play called Upland uh, based on that. <clears throat> and that's, that was part of the thing because there was a- Back and forth. Back and forth. Well, sort of on the topic of freedom of conscience, that was how Carr got Stuyvesant to surrender to him. Basically, you can believe whatever you want. We just want the docs, you know, et cetera. Right. Um, and there's much, you know, there's much more that can be said that Washington Irving evidently wrote a lot of, um, you know, about the expedition down to the Swedes in which the Swedes uh, are not necessarily the heroes. Uh, you know, it was, there weren't many of them, <clears throat> but their influence is still uh, felt. Um, some of them were, again, interp Penn's interpreters with the Indians. But part of the point is also Penn came uh, to treat them fairly. Um, part of the reason he could do that is because there already had been sort of a basis, you know, not that Lenape were particularly warlike, but nevertheless, um, you know, when, when King Philip's war was ravaging New England, this area was relatively peaceful. Um, and, and John first encountered the Court of Upland because he studied to be a lawyer. And that was one of the things he learned about. I did a monograph for it. Cause I mean, it was sort of, a, they had no money. Every single course, how the hell are we gonna pay for this? How are we gonna do this? It took however long to send to New York for instructions. I mean, it was sort of, they were basically sort of on their own trying to do the best they could. Um, I had a, uh, met someone one time who knew about the court and there was a, man whose son had gone quite mad. So instead of treating him as like, you know, possessed by demons or something, they realized he was mad and they got together to build a blockhouse where he could be kept safe and everyone else could be kept safe. Sort of like, you know, in a sense, um, as close to humane treatment of the mentally ill as we had at that point. Uh, I probably answered your question in a rather meandering fashion. <laughs> I appreciate it, thank you. Linear thinking is not one of my strong suits. <laughs> Mine neither. We're, we're on the same page. Okay. <laughs> what do you do? I'm a doctoral student at Jefferson. And so I'm new to this area. And I live in the Aronimic Estates area of Drexel ah. Hill here in Upper Darby. Yep. Yeah. And so I was curious to see the name. I wrote down the word Aronimic because it clearly yes. has a Native American root that I wasn't yes. aware of. And but then also, I, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Red Arrow yeah. was originally Red Aronimic, yeah. um, et cetera. I mean, there, um, there's a map that I was able to take a picture of, but not really able to focus on the details uh, of the area prior to the arrival of Penn. And that's kind of the interesting thing is that, you know, Penn didn't come to this, you know, complete wilderness. There was a court system, there were people, there was trade with Barbados going on, there were, you know, all sorts of things. And again, six blind men and the elephant. Where are you standing? What can you see? Yeah. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. 
Okay. <laughs> I yeah. um so then Lenape did trade with foreigners other than um like the like Penn when he came already. Well, there there were a lot of trade relationships between the various nations. Mm -hmm. you know, it's um and uh there was a lot of trade. Again, when the Europeans came, they sort of changed the dynamic. Mm -hmm. And beaver uh, became very um, valuable. Uh, and beaver not for the skins, but beaver for the fur, mm -hmm. which was taken and made into felt. You sort of like crush it together into, and beaver, uh, beaver skin hats were very, were the rage yeah. in Europe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, also again, uh, in a, the technological uh, advances of the settlers were quite um, compelling. Mm -hmm. uh, the Lenape were sort of under the thumb of the Iroquois Federation. Uh, they've been called um, the, key, the keepers of the Eastern Gate and also women. Uh, but they, you know. Because they were not warlike. Um, because they were not warlike. They were not warlike. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, market motivating white, yeah. Um, Diplomats. Yeah, it's um, trade was going on. I mean, once the English were here, they were sort of monopolized it. Mm -hmm. um, but there always has been trade going on between um, between groups. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you want to say anything about the last things that you had pictures of, like the the the, the, the hole in cellars and stuff like that, or does that come later? I I, I mention it later. Okay. You may have seen the one sixth of a dollar, which was printed in uh, seventeen seventy six by Hall and Sellers, one of the settlers I'm going to talk about in the in the next segment, with the Sellers family who came with decals and were printers. Mm -hmm. Um, the yeah. picture of the um, corn, the love, peace, truth, and plenty um, was the reverse of the Penn family uh, seal, yeah. I believe. And it's, you know, it's a nice motto. <laughs> when in doubt, love, truth, peace, and plenty. Uh, I have what a else? good question. Yeah. Um, the ahead. red arrow line for the trolley, does that have to do with Aronimic? They they chose that name Red Runamink, which became Red Arrow, and that's for like the trolley line. Remember that used to be it, Red Arrow. Or you were exactly. There. There's a there's okay. another. I didn't really get to it uh, in the next section, but in Darby there was a gentleman by the name of John Drew, who mm -hmm. was an African American ice merchant and fairly successful, mm -hmm. and he in 1917 started Jitney service because domestic help in Lansdowne had to walk to their jobs. So mm -hmm. he, and he uh, which may be one of the first PUC licenses on the Jitney service. He, oh, sold, wow. he yeah. sold his Jitney service to Red Runamink uh, in I believe um, sometime in the 1930s with the, mm -hmm. with the proviso that his workers would still have jobs, mm -hmm. et cetera. So that was sort of folded into Red, uh, into Red Arrow, Red Runaway. Mm -hmm. If you go to 69th Street, there is a picture, I believe, of John Drew and some of the, some of the trolleys that are yeah, a part of the system that sort of yeah. consolidated to become um, the SEPTA system. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're going to sing you one, one more quick song. Um, Bum, 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 bum. I went to Dar I took my Tweety down, down to Old Darby bum, 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 so I could ride upon a PCC. They've got a trolley there, oldest you can find. Listen to it rumble in, love motion on the line. Uh, I will, uh, as a commercial, I will say darlyhistory.com um, is, I've lost the ability to edit it, but most of the information there is okay in some presenting some of a chaotic situation, but darbyhistory.com, you may enjoy that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Okay. Should we hop right into part two then? I think, I think so. Yes. Yeah. Okay.
Let's do it. I'm gonna Mute get my screen ready. Okay, and you call this part stories. William Penn was a visionary, but also a man plagued by financial and family troubles. The son of a famous admiral, William Penn the Younger was trained as a military man, but was expelled from Oxford and frequently imprisoned had become, in the words of diarist and sample leaders, a Quaker again, or some sudden melancholy thing. He greatly vexed his famous father, who captured Jamaica the English, when in the finance victims against the Dutch, a man who was literally the friend of kings, to at least one king, and who was the man for whom Pennsylvania was named. Wait a minute. Pennsylvania was named after William Penn the Quaker. I hear you say, David Lynn. Nay, not so. When the English decided to settle the Civil War after the turmoil of the Cromwell years by inviting Charles II back as king, Admiral Penn was trusted enough by both sides to bring Charles from France for the restoration. Quakers didn't believe in naming things that to themselves, and William Penn the Quaker wanted to call his grand to Wales, a position that came to change him. We will keep it, said the Mary Monarch, and not on your account, my dear fellow. Don't flatter yourself. We'll keep it to commemorate the name of the Admiral Trouble Father. It is said that the grant was given to the son as a way to settle the debt owed to the father, but it may also have been a way to get rid of some of the Quakers who did not pay tithes to the Church of England and cluttering up the jails. It may also have been a way to put a pacifist buffer between Protestant New England and Catholic Maryland. For whatever reason, William Penn, who experienced the great fire of London and the plague, had very definite ideas as he recruited people for his holy experiment. One of the things that made Pennsylvania unique is the Quakers were welcome, along with people of other faith traditions. As long as one creator was acknowledged, the method of worship would not be interfered with. It came here to be free for religious liberty, and in honor to and me, and said we could worship freely too. Whether Catholic or Jew, other Protestant sects do, and Quakers brought a few, he helped them all to do their part. Just give the a try, and that's a big thing. Just try what love will do, and that's a big thing. I see God in all of you. Together we can work and all come through. We can do it together and be friends of Pennsylvania. We can do it together and be friends of Pennsylvania. We can do it together and be friends of Pennsylvania. Darby was settled by people from Derbyshire, and notable early settlers included John Blumstone who served as Speaker of Pennsylvania Assembly and owned a large part of Darby, William Wood, who owned another large part of Darby, John Bartram, grandfather to the famous botanist, and the Sellers family who brought decals, which was paper making, and established a printing business. This was one sick of a dollar, printed by Hall and Sellers in 1776. Penn was also credited with amicable relationships with the native inhabitants. But he was aided by the previous peaceful relations established earlier by the Swedes. It's likely that these settlers were present at the famous and apocryphal Shackamaxon Treaty, which Voltaire described as a treaty never sworn to and never broken. The story of the infamous walking purchase, Swindle, perpetrated by Penn's sons, is a topic for another presentation. It may seem somewhat strange to realize, but not for Darby, we may never have had a Liberty Bell originally called the State House Bell. People didn't start to call it the Liberty Bell until the 1830s when it became a symbol of the anti-slavery movement. Well, Darby was not the only reason for the bell. It certainly played a part. 
this anomaly. Of course, everyone knows about the Liberty Bell and the inscription. Proclaim liberty throughout the land, and everybody knows the bell is cracked. No, no, that's not the connection. We had nothing to do with this cracking. Anyway, the inscription on the bell is from a book of the Bible called Leviticus, chapter 25, verse 10. And when you read the whole verse, it becomes very interesting. The whole verse says, And ye shall hallow the fifteenth year, and proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. So what was this fifteenth year stuff? Well, 50 years before the bell was ordered for the Pennsylvania State House, later called it a Penn's Hall, William Penn signed something in 1701 called the Charter of Privileges. This was just before Penn went back to England for the second and final time. And the colonists in Penn's Hall, the experiment, wanted some written guarantee of their rights. And one of the colonists was John Blunston, who lived in, right, Darby. Not only did he live in Darby, but he was one of the first settlers of Darby born the same year as William Penn, and owned a big chunk of Darby. As a matter of fact, it was Blunston who gave the land which the Quakers used for their burial ground and for their first meeting house. You can still see the burial ground on the hill at 12th and Main in Darby, and Blunston himself is buried there somewhere. I'll talk about that later. So what's the big deal about a charter? Aren't our rights guaranteed by the Bill of Rights, freedom of speech and all that? Not at that time. In 1701, the province of Pennsylvania was owned by the Penn family, and they made all the rules. After all, King Charles II had given the land to Penn in honor of Penn's father, Admiral Penn, and insisted it be named Pennsylvania in honor of the father. Now, Penn did have something called a frame of government, which set up the way things would be done. But many of the colonists didn't trust the Penn family and were afraid the rules would be changed. One of these people was David Lloyd, who didn't like the Penn family at all at all, and thought the seat of government should be at Chester, where it started, and, in his opinion, belonged. So you had a group of people around Lloyd who wanted to stick it to the proprietary party, and the Penn family, in any way they could. And you had Penn, who didn't want to give up his power. And in the middle, you had, ta-da, John Blunston, who may have served as a mediator and dealmaker. He had been a trusted friend of Penn from the beginning, and was likely with Penn at the famous treaty at Shackamaxon. I was able to talk with both sides to get the thing signed. The Charter of Privileges was an important model of representative government and religious toleration. Later on, when the Constitution was drafted, and Darby played a part. So when Isaac Norris was looking for an inscription for the State House Bell, honoring the Charter of Privileges seemed appropriate, and the verse from Leviticus seemed to fit, and the rest, as they say, is history. There is some speculation that Norris was also making a plea against slavery and against the land grabs caused friction with the Indians, but that is another story. I said he would talk about the burial grounds, and here it is. At various times, Quakers did not agree with the practice of putting up headstones on graves, believing it was a sign of worldly vanity. So we don't know exactly where John Blossom was buried when he died in 1723. Nevertheless, when you pass a burial ground in 12th and May, and think about the American liberties we enjoy, you may want to whisper a small thank you to John Blunston at rest on the hill. While we're on the topic of cemeteries, Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, history is biography. And if this is so, Darby Watershed is filled with wonderful stories. From the people buried in local churchyards like Darby Friends Burial Ground, or St. James Church at King Sessing, to the landscape memorial parks for the living, which were part of the rural cemetery movement. Everyone has a story to tell. The rural cemetery movement began in the 1830s as the Industrial Revolution was ravaging the land, and in our area is represented by Mount Moriah, located on both sides of Cobbs Creek and Yale, Delaware County, and in Philadelphia. One of the more interesting cemeteries in the watershed is Eden Cemetery in Collingdale, which used to be Darby, and which used to be the Bartram family farm. Eden was a receiving cemetery, and in addition to people directly buried there, such as singer Mary Anderson, a number of people were moved from other cemeteries, including Octavius Cato and William Still. Mary Anderson is one of the more well-known citizens of Eden. In 1939, the famous singer was refused permission to sing at Constitution Hall for the audience of 5,000 against a racial prejudice. But with the help of Eleanor Roosevelt and others, 
She was able to perform on the Washington Mall for an audience of some 75,000 people and a worldwide audience of millions. This petty act of racism was transformed. Not as well known, but also significant, is Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, who was an abolitionist, speaker, writer, poet, and advocate for women's rights. In May 1866, Harper addressed the 11th National Women's Rights Convention in New York City, where she shared the platform with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. She made a speech called, We Are All Bound Up Together, in which she foreshadowed Dr. Martin Luther King, saying, this grand and glorious revolution which has commenced will fail to reach its climax of success until throughout the length and breadth of the American Republic, the nation shall be so colorblind as to know no man by the color of his skin or the curl of his hair. Other citizens of Eden who worked for freedom and human dignity include underground railroad icon William Still, who was a successful ice merchant who served on the Vigilant Committee and who led a petition drive to desegregate Philadelphia's streetcars. At the time, another citizen of Eden is John Pierre Burr, son of Bryce Fred Aaron Burr, who signed Frederick Douglass's call to arms during the Civil War, and who worked as a barber, and also ran an academy that taught public speaking to young African-American men. Another man of parts was Octavius Valentine Cata, who taught Greek and Latin at what became Cheney State University, raised a regiment during the Civil War, and was murdered in 1871 in the first election in which African Americans had the right to vote. All of these people, and others, have important stories to tell. One of the stories is about architect Julian Abel, the first African American graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, whose town was recognized by famous architect Horace Trumbauer, and who was in charge of Trumbauer's office, designing the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Free Library of Philadelphia, and Duke University, among other buildings. One irony is that even though he designed Duke University because he was Black, he could not visit. As I mentioned before, many of the first settlers of what became Delaware County at the Darby Creek watershed were from Derbyshire in England, who found so much rain to what they experienced earlier. In 1743, possibly inspired by Franklin's library company, the people in Derby wanted a library and asked John Bartram, whose grandfather had purchased land from William Penn and who had become a famous botanist. The story is that he was plowing the field one day and got down a daisy and was struck to his core by its beauty, its symmetry, its complexity. And he said to himself, I've looked at these things all my life, but I've never seen one. What else have I looked at but haven't seen? He went into town, bought a Latin grammar and the trees by Carl Linnaeus on botany and taught himself Latin and botany and eventually became a royal botanist, purchased land along the Schuylka River, and basically started America's first seed catalog company, collecting specimens of plants and corresponding with the worldwide scientific community of the day. One of the people with which he corresponded was a Peter Collison, who was an English Quaker, and Bartram would send him samples of various plants. Bartram asked Collison to buy certain books and ship them back in the books called Bartram boxes in which he had originally shipped specimens. And that was the nucleus of the Darby Library. And the original books can still be seen on display in the Darby Library. Among the Quakers, botany was one of the few art forms that was encouraged. And one of the famous phrases from William Penn is, it would go a great way to caution and direct people in the use of the world if they're better studying the creation of it. For how could man find the confidence to abuse it? I should see the great creator stare him in the face in all and every part thereof. Quakers, the Darwin Creek Valley was a hotbed of anti-slavery activity. One of the centers was in Sharon Hill, which became Sharon Hill, from John Jackson's Sharon Female Academy. The term William Still, who was buried in Eden Cemetery, worked with Thomas Garrett and others as part of the Philadelphia Vigilance Committee. He is buried Thomas Garrett with his brother Edward of Upper Darby. He helped some 2,700 people to freedom. Arrested because of his activity and bankrupted by the court, he nevertheless said, thou hast left me without a dollar. I say to thee and to all in this courtroom, that if anyone knows a fugitive that wants shelter, send him to Thomas Garrett. 
and he will befriend him. One of the other people involved in the Underground Railroad was Charles Lloyd, a proprietor of the Bluebell Inn on Cobbs Creek, who was said to have taken an escaped slave who appeared at Darby, nursed him back to health, and then paid for his passage out of the country. There also is another story that a slave got along well with his owner, who was in financial trouble. The owner said to him, I'm going to lose everything. Find someone to buy you, make the best deal you can. That gentleman went to Charles Lloyd, who agreed that he would buy him under the condition that he become free after a certain number of years. This gentleman was later instrumental in forming of another figure of some interest is Passmore Williamson, who once owned a house in Derby, served with Still and Garrett on the Vigilant Committee, and was instrumental, along with William Still, in the liberation of Jane Johnson, who was a slave woman being taken through Philadelphia with her two children on their way to Nicaragua, where her owner, Colonel John Hill Wheeler, was U.S. Minister to Nicaragua. And Pennsylvania at that time had a personal liberty law that said if a slave was brought into Pennsylvania, that slave could claim freedom. Wheeler was evidently aware of this, but thought it was not possible that Jane would leave, that Jane's not going to leave such a kind man as I am. But in Bloodville's hotel, she whispered to a porter, I want to meet you. That porter then contacted William Still, who contacted Passmore Williamson. And together they went up to Jane on the boat, uh, out where the Seaport Museum is located and said, by the laws of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, you are free if you would like. Jane said, always wanted to be free. Wheeler tried to restrain her, but some deckhands who were there restrained Colonel Wheeler and they safely left the boat. At that time, Jane Johnson, her two sons, and William Still went in one direction. Passmore Williamson went back to the office where he was a land conveyancer. The next day, he was served with federal writ of habeas corpus under the federal feudal slave law to produce John, to produce Jane Johnson in the courtroom of Judge John Kinsey Kane, so she could be recaptured under federal law. The day before, Passmore had deliberately not asked where Jane was being taken, and he said, "Honestly, I don't know where she is." This angered the judge, who threw him to Moyamensing Prison where he languished for 100 days. It was sort of like the OJ trial of the day. His visitor book is signed by Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, basically anyone who was anyone in the anti-slavery movement. At the same time, William Still and the deckhands were put on trial for riot, assault because they had touched Colonel Wheeler, and kidnapped because clearly Jane didn't want to leave such a kind man. Jane Johnson came back and testified at their trial that she left on her own free will. She came into the courtroom flanked by four Quaker women, including Lucretia Mott. They noticed federal marshals standing at the back of the room ready to arrest her under the federal Fugitive Slave Act. A Philadelphia policeman by the name of George Corson was equally determined that she would remain free under Pennsylvania law. So when she left the stand, she was taken out a side door and in the words of Lucretia Mott, we did not take our time going home. This conflict between state law and federal law is still playing out today. I'm indebted to historian Nancy Webster for much information about the Underground Railroad, including the context. People create familiar patterns so that any change in that pattern is noticed. Therefore, a church is not a good place to hide fugitives because it kept for Sunday there was little activity and people notice the change in patterns. Fugitives might be hidden in a barn or in the woods and moved by people who would be expected to be out at odd hours, such as a farmer making milk deliveries or a midwife. Stories of codes and disguises are common. And so during the British occupation of Philadelphia in 1777, General Howe was able to capture the rebel capital of Philadelphia but he did not have control of the river forts at Fort Mifflin or at Red Bank, and as a consequence could not bring his ships upriver for supplies. So every time he needed supplies, he would have to forage in the countryside or send wagons down to Chester where they were 
vulnerable to the American insurgents stationed at various places around the city. One of the places where about 28 picket guards were stationed was at Bluebell. The bombardment at Fort Mifflin started in October of 1777 and continued day and night until the middle of November. Cornwallis sent 2,500 troops down the Derby Road past the Bluebell on their way to Chester to join with General Wilson and finally subdue the forts at Red Bank. The picket guard at the Bluebell was under the command of General Porter. As 2,500 troops marched past, the story is a shot was fired from an upstairs window. The British rushed in, bayoneted five Americans on the stairs and took the remainder prisoner. The shot wounded a British officer who was brought into the bell where he died. His last words were, I knew I would never leave this accursed place. And according to the caretakers at Bluebell, he didn't. Sometimes June, the caretaker would report that the rocking chair would rock and there was no one in the chair. She would feel a hand stroking her hair and there was no one there. And her son Tristan, and her son Tristan said that he heard a voice in his head. He said, who are you? And the reply was, I'm Colonel Jonathan Rabbit, friend of the king. Why are you talking to me? Well, you remind me of my son. Why are you here? This may have been the imagines of an eight-year-old boy, we don't know. We have not been able to find any record of a Colonel Jonathan Rappin, but we do know that the Battle of the Blue Bell occurred. There are some papers showing the mention of Michael Richter, who was wounded in an action at the sign of the bell. I apologize for the um, erratic audio. Um, putting this together, I use something called um, Movie Maker and various pieces kind of putting together, um, not meshing as smoothly as I would wish. Are there any questions? There's an underground railroad in a house over here, right up the street. Um, do you know, in Springfield, it's, I guess, I, I don't know, technically, I think it's Ridge Lane now, over, um, I live on Darby Creek in Springfield, my house backs up to the quarry on Reed Road, I don't know. There, there are a lot, well, the Quakers were one of, okay. The, the basic tenet in Quakerism that everyone has within them um, the spark of the divine, regardless of your condition or gender. Mm -hmm. um, and um, working with uh, the, Af the free African-American community, et cetera, there were a lot of, um, a lot of activity in the area. Um, Owning a slave, the first protest against slavery was 1688 in Germantown, the Quakers and mm -hmm. the Mennonites. Uh, John Blunston and three others um, took a protest to a Philadelphia yearly meeting in 1715 about the keeping of um, chattel. Um, it didn't become a disownable offense until 1776. Mm -hmm. um, and for Quakers, it was one thing to say, we will not keep slaves, but to affect someone else's economic well-being, uh, not everyone sort of got on board. But you did have various abolitionists like Lucretia Mott, uh, Passmore Williamson. Actually, the house that he owned was our house. Mm -hmm. um, and he has a, has a fascinating story, um, et cetera. You know, actually... Um, broke the law. Can I yeah, Jen. Okay. I, I just wanted to say that um, I recently, um, I'm uh, on the board of the Darby Library, have been since about two, uh, 2005. And we had a presentation by a, another local historian who's been very actively involved with the um, refer, re, redoing of the Quaker Meeting House across the street next to the library, mm -hmm. which was Darby Meeting House. 
And um, what he has found in his research is that Darby meeting was definitely against slavery and even brought it up to yearly meeting and everybody. And finally, uh, when the Hicksite split came, um, the people who didn't agree with them moved out um, and became Lansdowne meeting. Um, mm -hmm. because the, the Darby people were very, very much against slavery, which is one of the reasons that they, in fact, would would not leave in their meeting somebody who continued to keep a slave, mm -hmm. uh, which was very unusual, even among mm -hmm. the Quakers. Um, so I think that that was another reason why there was so much Underground Railroad or whatever you want to call it, activity in this area because there okay. was also a fairly large population, both in the Darby area and in what's now the Southwest Philadelphia area of free people of color. So there was a lot of things going on that way. And so it just it wasn't just like the Civil War in that movement. No. It was long before it's that. Long before. Long before. Yeah. Well, that's uh, the Passmore Williamson thing in 17, uh, sorry, 1855 was sort of in the shadows of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. The first fugitive slave law was 1793. And then the fugitive slave law of uh, 1850 um, allowed someone chasing a slave to deputize anyone they wanted to recapture the slave. And it was one of the things that sort of exacerbated the tension between um, the slaveholding states and the, and the free states. Mm -hmm. If you're near Drexel, uh, if you're in Drexel Hill near Drexel Junction, uh, you're not too far from the house of Thomas Garrett, yeah. uh, who was one of the, um, again, one of the people uh, very instrumental uh, in the Underground Railroad. And a member of the Darby meeting. And a member of Darby meeting. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, let me see. I'm trying I to always wondered where this one went, like, because it goes under West Rolling Road. It goes from their house under under West Rolling Road, but that's that. Then it's the golf course. Yeah, so, is that, are you speaking about a tunnel? Yes, yes, it's an actual tunnel. Okay, um, I don't know. I mean, the the term underground railroad mostly meant clandestine. Yeah, yeah, like as opposed to actually them. hidden. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was illegal. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. to do that, and that um, one of the things that makes William still sort of. Uh, important is he was. If you have you ever seen the movie Harriet? No, I haven't. If you have a chance, it's definitely worth seeing. William Still uh, plays a large part in that movie and in the entire movement. Um, he would take down the descriptions of escaped slaves coming through Philadelphia uh, so that their families could later be reunited, mm -hmm. um, etc. There are, you know, as I say, there, <laughs> there, there are many stories left to be uncovered and told. The problem mm. is that there's not a whole lot of documentation because mm. it was illegal. Yeah. Secret. <laughs> you know, like, the it's... only thing over here was Lamb Tavern I know, and like maybe Rose Tree Tavern. Yeah, other it's, than that, in some it's houses. hard to tell. Sometimes people find a small, like a little space in their house and they say, oh, wow, this was, a, you know, where slaves hid. And oftentimes was built in the uh, 1920s for prohibition. This house is a lot older than that. It's a, it's a yeah. old, yeah, you would, you would know the house. But yes, it does actually go, I think it goes from a fireplace, excuse me, down to, um, it goes out under West Rolling Road, but that's, it's, it's in the mm. you know, that's history. interesting because there have always been lots of stories about the bluebell having having uh, tunnels it, it, to various places and mm -hmm. um what one of the things that we've found is that people often thought there were tunnels because the underpinnings of the fireplaces look like an entrance to a tunnel mm -hmm. that's the way they're built in order to save stone would kind of be an arch yeah arch yeah. shape yeah um and may not be a tunnel um, I, I'd love to learn more about this. This sounds uh, fascinating. Yeah, Springfield Township has a history. It's in the libraries. Yeah. yeah. Um, that little history book that people lived in caves along uh, like Sedley Park. Well, yes, um, certainly um, 
I believe uh, Pastorius in Germantown German, did, yeah. and uh, Johannes Kelpius, yeah. who arrived mm -hmm. on the night of the Feast of St. John, mm -hmm. uh, went to the highest point around, which was Fairmount, built mm -hmm. a bonfire and kicked over the glowing coals, um, which I think the Feast of St. John might be May Day. I'm I, not sure. Yeah, I think. One of the things Jen and I do is we write and sing Groundhog Day carols. Right. <laughs> and Groundhog Day is a cross quarter day. It's the halfway point between the winter solstice and the spring equinox. Oh, and my birthday too. There's a there's a, <laughs> there's, there's, a there's a change in the light quality. The early church had gone as candle mass. Mm -hmm. Then you have May Day, which is between the equinox and the summer solstice, mm -hmm. um, which um, is the start of Celtic summer. Then you have Lugnasa, which is the harvest of first fruits, um, which is like August 1st. I mean, it's still August, mm -hmm. but you look up, you see a September sky. And then you have Soween or Samhain, which is the um, halfway point between the um, autumnal equinox and the winter solstice, uh, which is why the church of God is All Saints Day and All, um, Hallows, Eve. All Hallows Eve, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, and why, why we sell, celebrate Christmas in December? Because a Christ child was probably born in the spring when the shepherds were in the fields. Mm -hmm. the but people noticed that the sun was dying until it got to a certain point and was reborn. Mm -hmm. and so the early church said, okay, same holiday under new management. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I knew that they think that he was born in the spring. Yeah. yeah, but uh, yeah, I didn't know the, why they. Did but it was, I mean, people are going to be celebrating it anyway, so you know, uh, I think there's a f famous phrase: "It's easier to ride the horse in the direction which it is going." <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the things that has been um, of interest to us, because of being both interested in history and music and other things, is that we found connections when we lived in Southwest Philadelphia by being involved with the Bluebell and starting that work back in uh, 1983, 84. Mm -hmm. We finally, we, we founded Friends of the Bluebell in 85 officially. Um, and then finding out about the people who were the, the people who ha were responsible for founding this area of Darby um, and the house that we own in Darby uh, across from the library was, um, first inhabited, as far as we know, by the daughter and son-in-law of John Blunston. And, oh, wow. uh, so, and, and then we found out later when we discovered things about, um, um, uh, what's his name? The one from Jane Johnson. I'm from Jane Johnson's- Oh, Passmore Pas Williamson. Passmore, I couldn't think of his name, sorry. Passmore Williamson had once owned our house there too. The, that was the house that he owned in Darby um, for a short period of time. But that was after he had already saved Jane Johnson many years later. He he was an interesting fellow because he really suffered greatly for the things that he did. His, his health was sorely affected by the time he spent in Moyamensing prison. Uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and he and his wife both had afflictions based on that time. So again, on my commercial, DarbyHistory.com has information about Passmore Williamson, uh, including the, ba the ballad of Passmore Williamson. You know, it's sort of, uh, oftentimes doing the right thing comes at a great cost. Mm -hmm. That's true. Anyway. Well, we hope that um, we have sparked your interest in not only what we know about the lower part of the watershed, but uh, an opportunity to delve into more of the history of the watershed in your own area. Um, one of the things that, oh, uh, yeah, one of the things that I always tried to do when I was um, in charge of um, the Darby Creek cleanup was instead of going after a large donor, I always tried to get a lot of local donors from various parts of the watershed so that people would have a feeling of ownership um, and a feeling of responsibility for the part of the Darby Creek that they loved and used 
as a family or as individuals. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that's one of the reasons that we had such good luck in in um, having recruits for people all up and down the watershed to start to be official captains and cleaners of the creek. And that has continued well past the time that John and I were involved with it. I know I wanted the swim club. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I live right across from Darby Creek. I'm on that flood flood plan yeah. on Darby. Yeah. It's yeah. at the bottom of a bowl. Yeah. You know, it's um, and there's been so much development up upstream that it that it's really tough because did um, you hear about the Donguanella track? Yes. 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 Yeah. That awesome. That's um yeah. you know, it, it I think it's <laughs> yeah, like uh was Will Rogers say, buy land but not make any more of it. <laughs> yeah. Um can can we sing you one more song? Sure. Okay, but um Oh, the watershed's wide and the waters drain to a common point every time it rains. But when that rain has no place to go, the waters rise and overflow. There are many and, verses and, and of that so one too. <laughs> well, we've had fun over the years because we have found that music is a way of um, teaching, which we call stealth education, because mm -hmm. people are enjoying the music and they are learning things at the same time, and then they get interested. Um, and one of the things that I have always admired about Darby Creek Valley Association and its way of doing things with the cleanups was to get kids involved um, and uh, they grew up to be parents who get their kids involved. And mm -hmm. that's always been the case, which is a really neat thing about the organization because there's still so much work to be done. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it takes a lot of people. It takes more than a village. It takes a big village <laughs> because it's a very big watershed. I mean, mm -hmm. to think of a watershed that is in four different counties, 77 square miles, 31 municipalities, many of whom don't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons why we tried with all the things that we did to get local people involved so they would then get involved with their own political they're part, system. They're part of the creek. And they're part of, of the creek. Aurora, how are we doing on time? I mean, I... Um, we're fine. We're fine. I just was about to say, um, and that, you know, we appreciate all you did to, for, for, you know, get the cleanups in the past and they are still going strong. Um, yes. So you laid a good solid foundation and, and uh, we thank you for that. And I just want to thank you for all the the obvious passion that you put into your work and for the work you put into this presentation. Um, well, can, can, we really sing the, can we sing the last part of the Darby Creek Valley song? I think we... Yeah. Sure. Um, Ahead, it works. is home to the algae oh, and mayfly, which, which may seem quite common and low, but, but without these to anchor the food chain, all life as we know it would go. For the algae is food for the mayfly, and the mayfly is food for the trout, and the trout will be somebody's dinner. We're all interdependent, no doubt. So enjoy all the fruits of the valley. Walk it past fish and streams, but be sure that you work for the health of the valley. So the waters will always be pure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. That was awesome. Thank Just you all. See you, thank you. And thank downstream. you all for joining us tonight. Yeah. Thank care. you, John thank and Jan, and for everyone else. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Well, that was yeah. great. Thank, thank you. Care. We'll see you downstream. Bye-bye. Okay. Okay.